Well, ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome uh, to this event on the German elections and their significance and uh, what they might mean going forward. Um, uh, this is an event at Chatham House. Have organized, uh, um, it's in association uh, with the British German Association, many of whose members are here. Um, I am um, I'm, uh, Maurice Fraser. I'm Professor of European Politics at the LSE. Um, the event is being held uh, on the record, just so you know, and it's also being streamed, uh, streamed, uh, streamed live. Um, I guess I should uh, invite you all uh, to uh, make sure, uh, that to particularly make sure, therefore, that as it's being streamed, to make sure that your phones are off or on mute or, or whatever. Please do, please do um, check. Um, now, the lineup that uh, Chatham House has uh, assembled um, uh, with the British German Association, I think, is uh, these will be. Um, not necessarily all, but I think, no, probably all, extremely familiar um, uh, names to you. And really, I don't think we could have got a better known uh, sort of uh, group of experts uh, known for their shrewdness, their, their, their perceptions, their deep knowledge of German politics, but also on the, painted on a broader canvas, on the European and, glo and, and, uh, and global canvas. And uh, as you've probably seen, the idea is to try to consider particularly the implications of the German elections for uh, the EU and Europe, uh, Europe as, as, as a whole. Uh, so, um, first off, um, I shall be asking uh, Constanze, Dr. Constanze Stelzenmuller uh, to uh, share some thoughts uh, uh, with us. She's Senior Transatlantic Fellow at the German Marshall uh, Foundation. She was formerly editor at uh, Die Zeit. Um, she's a governor of the Ditchley Foundation, uh, you, you, you name it, an expert on transatlantic relations. In fact, she gave a talk on that very subject a little bit uh, earlier today. Uh, many strings to her bow. I think that's true of all our speakers, actually, today, which was nice. So uh, these are Renaissance men and women with particular interest in Germany. Uh, I, Constance, stop it, Constance, stop it, just stop, stop, it, it, really. stop it, stop it, stop it. Okay. okay, all right. Um, so Constance will, will kick off, and she will be followed by uh, Thomas Keelinger, who I'm sure also is known, uh, has almost a household name and face. I don't think it's exactly in the last 30 odd years. Um, the BBC, um, uh, uh, obviously, uh, of Die Zeit, uh, sorry, of, of Die Welt, uh, and uh, uh, originally. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, sorry, Thomas. Of course, Die of course, Die Welt, I mean, synonymous with Die Welt, uh, formerly with the Rheinische Merkur, I think, some, some, some moons ago. Um, and, um, uh, and really one of the most respected uh, commentators and pundits on German politics, as, as you all know. And, and then we will have a British perspective. We will from, uh, uh, from David Marsh, uh, who is uh, chairman of SCCO International and co-chairman of the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions uh, Forum. Uh, he's deputy, he's uh, deputy chairman of the uh, German-British Forum, uh, and he's many, written many books on, on, the, on, on the euro and on uh, financial, European financial matters, his most recent being the euro, the battle for the new uh, global uh, currency. So um, he'll be giving a view from outside, as it were. Um, but without further ado, um, I would like to invite Constance to share some thoughts uh, with us. And, right. Uh, well, um, first off, thank you very much for this uh, very generous and over-generous introduction and for the invitation to Chatham House. I'm most impressed by the crowd here. Not all of you look German. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> well, there appears to be some interest. Um, that's fascinating. Um, you know, it used to be that we only thought of ourselves as a moral superpower. Uh, now these days, uh, one gets this distinct impression that people actually think we have uh, a role to play that's um, s slightly unsettling for us. Um, I'm also sort of very happy to be here on the, on the panel with, with David and with Thomas. Thomas being, I think, the, the, the only German who has an even more RP accent than I do, <laughs> um, which I'm always deeply impressed by. Um, in, in my case, it's because I spent my first childhood years here. Um, Morris has just told me that I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be the first speaker. I am not going to um, regurgitate uh, the daily news at you. I, I will say what I think is going to happen in the next couple of days and, and, uh, and then speculate a tiny bit about foreign policy and then hand over to you two. Um, now, you've all seen the numbers. Uh, you've, you've read the headlines. What is going to happen? There is 
uh, I think a surprising amount of speculation about what I think is an incredibly obvious outcome. <laughs> there is um, speculation about whether, and, I mean, some people are even spending precious printer's ink on the question whether Angela Merkel might not be so upset by the prospect of another grand coalition that she would be willing to call new elections. This is not going to happen. It is just not going to happen, nor, and it's the other ludicrous suggestion out there that people are spending time on, nor will there be a tolerated minority government by Angela Merkel. Not going to happen. Also, there will not be a red, uh, sorry, a black-green coalition. Um, the CSU, uh, now run solely by Horst Seehofer, who amazingly got an absolute majority in the Bavarian elections a week ago, after, after all, having fathered an illegit illegitimate child and, and done a couple of rather spectacular U-turns on policy issues. Um, astonishing for most of us, but there you are, and he's got a fair amount of say. Um, so I think as long as the CSU doesn't like the prospect of a coalition with the Greens, and as long as half the Greens would be utterly miserable with that prospect, we're not going to have a black-green coalition. Much as there still are some Greens and quite a lot of Conservatives um, who would be thrilled by that. But I, I think it is the, the uh, very, very unlikely. So what we're faced with is the prospect of another grand coalition, which we had uh, four years ago. Um, the SPD didn't like it. It um, ended up in a miserable, in fact, their worst post-war uh, polling ever, 23%. Uh, they've landed barely north of that this time. They know it's going to be miserable, but they have promised and they would be staking the, 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 you know, the last bits of their credibility if they now turned around and said, we'll, we'll do a red-green uh, red coalition. That's not going to happen either. So the SPD has no choice but to face uh, Angela Merkel and another coalition, um, which is going to be interesting for foreign policy and security policy wonks like me, um, because the Social Democrats last time around had the foreign ministry, uh, they had a couple other ministries. Um, they are running out of personnel, it has to be said. But that is where we are. Um, we've just been speculating on how long coalition negotiations might take. Uh, last time around, it took nearly two months, and it wasn't pretty when we had a grand coalition. Um, Thomas and I were disagreeing on why it needs to be that nasty again. Um, I'm, my, my personal feeling is, you know, we've been there, we've done it, you know, we'll do it again, let's get it over with but I may not be getting something here. It's also not quite, frankly, not quite my expertise. So um, it is, I think, possible that we would have to wait until November um, for the formation of a government. The Bundestag will meet for the first time on October 22nd. That we do know. And all the parties are now going to have, and that's the sort of the, the first order of business right now, is for the parties to have so-called Kleine Parteitage, party conferences, uh, which will be, you know, which is another name for like Night of the Long Knives, uh, where people blame each other and decide, you know, who, you know, who who is out. Um, the Greens have have done the sort of, you know, the lemming thing, and sort of, uh, I think, 22 of them announced that they would resign. Only some of them then said that they would immediately run again. Um, but I think we will expect that an entire generation of of leadership, not just in the Liberals, but in the Greens and in the Social Democrats will, I think, make a decision um, to leave politics or at least leave the party leadership. Yeah? So we don't quite know yet the tableau with which um, the Bundestag will be put together uh, and the Bundestag leadership will be put together and, the, um, and, and in particularly who, who in the end will end up being the small group of people that the Germans would refer to as Ministrabe, available and able to, uh, to fill a ministerial posting, mm -hmm. and particularly not in some of the key postings. Um, so there you are. Um, that's uh, a reason why it's somewhat difficult to speculate on, um, on what kind of European foreign and security policy will come out of Berlin next. I will do so anyway, um, having been a journalist for a long time. Um, but um, I think what you're going to see, since the Euro crisis is not over, everybody has very kindly held their breaths uh, for the last weeks until we did our, had our election. Um, but I think after this we can expect, um, I think, bad news out of Greece, bad news out of Italy, bad news out of Spain. Uh, none of the metrics there are looking particularly good, even if some of them have improved. Um, and as a result, um, the government, uh, this next German government, will be spending an awfully, you know, a sort of a, a great amount of time, as before, on managing the crisis, and concomitantly less, as before, on other stuff. That, that said, I think there will be some shifts, and you've already seen some. Syria, for example, 
Um, and I'll stop with that because I presume that some of you will have more detailed questions and I, and I also don't want to take up too much airtime. But um, on Syria, um, it was uh, Vestabella, the outgoing foreign minister who was a liberal, um, <clears throat> did say on, October, uh, on, on August 26th um, in, a, in a speech that Germany would support whatever consequences there were. At the time, he was thinking of limited military strikes. That was a message to the rest of the world, particularly to the Europeans and the Americans, that we were not going, we were not going to be doing another Libya. Good news, I would think. Um, participating in military operations, particularly limited military operations, was never on the card. We weren't going to be asked to do that. But um, the appetite for that, of course, is very limited in the rest of the world anyway, and it, it has to be said with regard to Syria. So my, my sense is that the Germans will be fully occupied with crisis management. Um, we'll probably get into the weeds on that a little bit, on what that means in terms of policy. Um, I think the, there will be an outstretched hand to Great Britain in particular. Nobody really wants to see the UK leave, um, leave the EU at all. But nobody wants to pay, I mean, nobody wants a signal from Berlin that we'll pay whatever price. And with that, I'll stop for the book. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Hans. Hans. <laughs> Thomas, to you. Uh, thank you, Constance. It's a hard act to follow, I must say. In the olden days, when we had such a thing as a nuclear theology, you always had to be aware of the decapitating first strike, and you launched one against me, which uh, makes it hard for me to see if there is enough for me to add to your splendid presentation. Um, <laughs> since you have uh, concentrated on the non-predictability of Europe, which I share, uh, I will try and concentrate on facts. And my most important fact is that Angela Merkel has lost the election. She is a bereaved political widow. She lost her married partner, the Free Democrats. And that is um, the flip side of her victory, which of course is patently obvious. She lost the election in that she did not manage to make sure that her coalition partner stayed afloat. That in German history since 49 is a terrific landslide. The first time since the inception of the Federal Republic, the Liberal Party has disappeared. And we haven't yet kind of figured out what that may mean, because the remaining parties um, uh, outside the Angela Merkel's uh, um, uh, combination of CSU and CDU uh, are all left-wing or centre-left parties. Uh, there's no other sort of bourgeois, shall I say, party left to, to, to go into cahoots with. And that is, uh, that is a difficult uh, situation for her and makes the choice, even if it's a renewal of the Grand Coalition, so much harder for her. Uh, Angela Merkel is, is a black spider. She uh, kills off everyone who goes into bed with her. <laughs> the, the SPD suffered their worst result uh, at the end of 2009, uh, uh, the first time in government with her, by, by um, uh, registering 23%, which was an abominable uh, result. And the FDP, uh, next time around, uh, disappeared. So this is, the, this is what Angela Merkel wreaks on you when you decide to go into government with her. You have to be, if you are the SPD, very careful under what conditions you, you go back into, into a liaison and debate with her. And I predict that they will insist on pretty stiff demands, uh, the SPD that is. They're not going to sell themselves cheaply. Um, because um, they know that they are practically the only game in town, the only choice she has left. She can't uh, um, form government with the Greens. What, what have the Greens left as a policy, as a national policy? Well, one uh, vegetarian day in, in official canteens every week. That, that is the once great party of Hans Friedrich Genscher and uh, Lambsdorff has, has uh, ended up with uh, a vegetarian day once a week in, in official canteens. Uh, I, I know I'm slightly uh, being disingenuous here. They have a few more things to say, but the most important uh, tenets of their faith, of their ideology, which is ecological uh, advancement and, and improvement and reforms, she has stolen by abrogating um, uh, nuclear energy two years ago in a very sudden U-turn. Without uh, uh, consulting much, she, after the Fukuyama disaster in Japan, as you know, she decided on the spur of the moment to renounce nuclear energy for Germany. <coughs> For a woman who is known to be steady as it goes and careful and cagey and non-charismatic and unwilling to be confrontational and risk anything, it's an amazing uh, uh, um, uh, thing to have happened. Um, I am afraid we will see a renewal of the length of time it takes to form a coalition this time around. It took us 65 days in 19, 2009 to form a coalition. 
for anyone in Britain who contemplates that it will take this long for a British government to be created is absolutely unconscionable. The Queen needs her government in place within three or four days of the election. We take two months and more. If for no other reasons than having to, to, to quicken the pace of uh, negotiations, why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Angela Merkel famously said yesterday when she was asked about how long it might take, she said, thoroughness before speed. <laughs> this is such a German statement to make. It almost, uh, it almost uh, reinforces all the cliches you know about the Germans, the meticulousness and the steady as it go and the glacial pace of, of, of reform and, and, and business. So during those two months, it's very hard to say anything about Europe. We are not the only player uh, to, to decide that. Uh, other countries will have a say. A lot of water will flow down the Thames and, and the spray. Um, so I, I will br be brief and, and stop here um, uh, because, um, I, first of all, it's two months. We have to be patient. Uh, the SPD, when asked to come forward and uh, present themselves as likely partners, said to the mouse of Mr. Gabriel, well, don't call us before this Friday. They also need their time to uh, think about it. Um, it's been, it's been uh, uh, a real uh, um, landslide event in many ways, the disappearance of that one pivotal party, which was the kingmaker in post-war German history. You could not govern in Germany without the FDP making it possible to create a coalition with you. That's all gone. And if you look at the remaining parties, the three, uh, the, the SPD, the Linke, and the, um, the Green parties, they have a numerical majority. They could combine and defeat Pa Merkel and create Steinbrück as Chancellor of, of Germany. They, they would have five or six points majority, I believe, which of course is out of the question. But it hasn't been unknown in Germany that the losers of election form a coalition to not allow the winner to to, to, to um, uh, get away with it. Um, the famous case in 69 when Willy Brandt and Walter Scheel formed the uh, uh, Lib Lab coalition. I remember very well that night when Richard Nixon sent a congratulatory telegram to Kiesinger, the Chancellor, uh, wishing him well for having won the election. And the following day, it was clear that the losers had combined to defeat the CDU. So there's always a possibility that um, if this new coalition doesn't quite do its homework, um, uh, the SPD might contemplate perhaps leaving in mid-term and thinking of other options, which adds to the, to the mix of unpredictability, I'm sorry to say. Uh, we, we like to think of ourselves as such a stable and reliable uh, country. But, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty uh, around the corner, and we should not underestimate the haggling that is going to uh, now emerge between the two large parties. It's not going to be a repeat of the coalition, grand coalition. Uh, it's not very grand anyway, when you look at the size of the SPD. Uh, but they will exert a price. And there's a paradox, and that's my last thought. At the point of her, the height of her popularity, at the best result that she scored for her party in 20 more years, she is the most vulnerable to concessions demanded of her uh, from her coalition partner. So stay tuned for some rather fascinating developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, David, does, does David Cameron have reasons to be quite happy or very happy? Or the City of London have reasons to be quite happy, very happy to see Angela Merkel back? Well, uh, contrary you know. to what everybody says, everybody says markets like certainty. In fact, markets like uncertainty. And we're going to have plenty of that. So the city may well feel there's something to trade on here. I, I think the coalition negotiations will be nasty, brutish, and long. Uh, and so we, we will face a lot of um, problems and unpredictability. Uh, I fully agree that nothing can be ruled out in terms of the coalition. It's a major temptation for the left to go with the linker. Uh, Steinbuch will go off and spend more time with his bank account, and the, the party will move to the left. It's quite likely. And, and therefore, you may well see uh, several goes at forming a coalition. Uh, and you'll see a lot of swirling news coming out of Berlin, a lot of hurried press conferences, a lot of ministerial limousines going in and out, the people winding down the windows, not really be able to say anything very much. And during all this time, the real decisions need to be made in Europe and about Europe, and they will not be made. So I think this is possibly a, a very bad 
election for Europe. I fully agree that Mrs. Merkel, she's strong and weak at the same time. Her moment of apparent triumph is a moment of great weakness for all the reasons that Tom has said. Just one point about the SPD, um, that they are, are 16 percentage points behind in the voting. Uh, never since 1957 when Conrad Adenauer won an absolute majority has the SPD been so far behind the CDU and yet the people from the CDU are forced to try to do business with these people who have comprehensively lost the election. There will be enormous uh, backbiting and enmity about this. Don't forget we're talking about ministerial limousines here. We're talking about the post of state secretaries, ministers and so on. People will not want to give those SPD people posts in a government even though it is quite clear that she can only uh, carry on in a coalition. There is, of course, al already a grand coalition. As you look at what's going on in Hessen, uh, that is a forerunner of what we might see in Berlin. Um, Mrs. Merkel, she's been such a successful black widow, as Tom has said, she has killed off uh, all the pretenders. And there's nobody left uh, amongst the minister presidenten, apart from Seehofer, as Constancy said. And so she's lost her power uh, in the lender. Uh, there's a two-thirds majority against her, which makes it very difficult to get any legislation through. I think that uh, she has, her poison uh, has been so venomous that she might end up killing off herself. I, 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 I do, no, I, I mean this seriously. I do think the third term is a, is a time when she could be very vulnerable. I do not buy at all this idea that she could go off in the sunset halfway through when she's done 10 years, she's age 60, do a Tony Blair. There's very, very few people who can manage to actually quit politics at the high point. I think it'll be a fairly uh, position of failure during this third term. And I would like to end on this idea of the euro. Uh, the thing is, we haven't actually seen any hard choices probably being made up to now. The German taxpayer has hardly spent any money at all. It's been peanuts. There's been lots of promises, lots of pledges, lots of guarantees. The checks will be called in in the next three or four years, particularly in the case of Greece, where we know that uh, Greece will need not just more credits, but more debt relief, which is going to be incredibly difficult because the European Central Banks and the other official creditors will be called upon to forego loans in some way, which will cause distress amongst the taxpayers. Now, the whole point about the German election was that it was fought on redistribution. It wasn't fought on Europe. Uh, there's a lot of poor people in Germany. We might think they just go around uh, eating their bratwurst of silver spoons and with the latest uh, robot cars and everything, but there's a hell of a lot of people who feel that they've lost out in the last uh, four or eight years as a result of the big swing towards exports. A lot of ordinary working class people have had very stagnating incomes, as we all know. And you won't be able to spend that money twice. You won't be able to give it to Greece and also to give it to girls in Kirchen. In fact, it needs to be spent three times. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be renewed in West Germany, not so much in East Germany. And in fact, you also need to spend money on debt relief for the impoverished southern countries of Europe, uh, who may be recovering a little bit now, but their debt is still totally unsustainable. And you also need to pay for them to remain in the euro for the next uh, four to six years. So the really tough questions uh, have not been decided. The SPD do not want to simply be uh, Santa's little helper uh, helping Angela Merkel out. The, the wounds uh, of the last Grand Coalition have not been cauterized. The blood is still warm. Uh, and therefore, they will not go down that path again. I think that it's a very good thing, in a way, for harmonization of Europe, because Germany, in the next four years, may make France, Italy, and Spain look like stable countries. Oh. You want to come, please? Oh. I'm making Berlin sound like, you know, the, a, a splatter movie. Weimar. Oh. No, a splatter movie. I mean, honestly, no, no, really, not, this actually, is ludicrous. No. Um, no. And, and I think we should all keep our hats on and our hair on and, and sort of, you know, take a deep breath and look at some of the positives here. One, we didn't vote an anti-EU party into power. Yeah? Yes, they will go to town on the European elections, but you know what, the EP le elections really aren't that important. This is really good news. And some of you would have been extremely, most of you would have been extremely upset if they had been voted into power. They probably killed off the Liberals, which I, I, I tend to agree is not a good thing. Um, not that I, I mean, I think we ought to have had a Liberal Party. I'm not sure that with these people, but there you go. Um, the other thing is, um, David, you've been explaining just how nasty it's going to be with the SPD in the coalition negotiation and in, within the coalition after the negotiations. Look, we had that for the last four years with the Liberals. That is what coalitions are like. My, my sense is that your own conservative liberal government isn't that pretty either. 
I mean, really, um, let's, you know, ag again, you know, let's just turn down the rhetoric a little bit. We're not taking part in an ugly bit. contest, are we, today? I mean, we're, uh, we're not, uh, we're not no. talking about the UK. Well, I think we should, actually. Um, and I certainly will, if, you know, oh, if, if I feel challenged to do so. And I think there is uh, actually a fair, of, uh, a fair, I mean, we should be talking about how the UK and Germany, uh, what relationship they'll have and how they'll be working with each other, if at all, which I think they should be. And... Um, Finally, you know, this, all this language, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I will sort of use metaphors with, with the rest of them, but this, um, I think if we were talking about a male chancellor, um, we would be, all of us would be saying, God, what a strong man this is. You know, what a successful leader. You know, and he's really, he's elim eliminated all the competitors. There is actually still a competitor left standing. She happens to be a woman, Ursula von der Leyen, who, unlike Merkel, exudes ambition, which is probably her biggest weakness. Um, but the fact of the matter is, much as I, I personally dislike some of Merkel's decisions and her leadership style, she is an extraordinarily strong politician, and I think we have to, to, to diminish her, uh, I think, is to not understand the, the, um, the amount of things that she can still do. And um, while, I mean, obviously we are talking about last term, and last terms rarely end in glory. That is the nature of last terms. But I, I, the, 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 I think the important thing to understand about her is that this is somebody who is profoundly disinterested in her legacy or in the pr impression that she makes on others. She has ideas. She certainly has strategic goals that she would like to push through. But she is not needy or neurotic yeah, in the ways that some German chancellors have been. And we can all think of examples. Um, and so she I hasn't think hired Tom Keelinger to write her biography no. yet. Yeah. But no, uh, maybe that she should have happen. one. That yeah. can still happen. Mm. But what I'm saying is, you know, hold your breaths. I think this could still become interesting and not as unpleasant as has been suggested here. Yeah. Um, okay, Tom, very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. I, I tend to um, uh, want to stress David. what um, <laughs> uh, um, David said about the uh, disenfranchised uh, class in Germany, which has been grown. People who are on short-term or mid-term contracts, which are not safe, uh, and uh, about which the remaining left-wing parties will, will be, you know, go all over the place, reminding Angela Merkel that she has to do something in this regard, which, in, in a funny way, will allow her to stay the course, her rigid austerity course, in, in the issue of the euro, because she can't spend her tax money twice. She can't under the influence and under the demands of the SPD who will, who will want to make her address the problem of the disenfranchised German population who are not quite as wealthy as some people seem to think. Uh, she, can't sort of, she hasn't got enough money left in the kitty to pay for the improvement of this sexual society, which has been the result of the, of the 2010, uh, uh, Agenda 2010, uh, the result of the liberalization of the labor markets, uh, and at the same time, loosen the strings as it were in the austerity regime about the euro. So in a funny way, the, the, the popular demand, I mean, popular, um, uh, popular opinion in Germany is a real coalition partner. The first coalition partner is a popular opinion. A popular opinion in Germany, a predictable demand, uh, a, a lifting of the lower paid uncertain classes who have suffered as a result of 2010 reform programs and, and not spend any more on, on saving Greece or other European countries. So that's, I think, where the main domestic emphasis will, will have to come up. Thomas, t thank you very much. Um, I, um, uncharacteristically, for, uncharacteristically for me, will try to obey a self, uh, heroically obey a self-denying uh, ordinance, not ask questions. I hope we will have a chance to touch on uh, Cameron Merkel, British election in 2015, possibly a British referendum in 2017 on a new relationship with Europe. Uh, maybe it'll come up in questions. I hope so. Um, please uh, do indicate if you would like to put a question. I will ask you the usual things, namely to keep it, please keep it short and sweet. Don't try to smuggle a second question in um, <laughs> under or after, uh, after the first. Say who you are and what your affiliation is, and please hold the microphone uh, as close to your mouth as possible. Um, uh, so, please, who would like to, uh, ask, uh, who would like to ask a question? Yes, Steve. Uh, Ron Freeman, member of the Pitt Committee of Chatham House. We heard Jens Feidman at this very podium a year ago, June, speak uh, very clearly in terms of austerity as his uh, policy. In fact, he described France as a Mediterranean country, which was not a compliment. As a result of this election, uh, will Mr. Weidmann's influence on Mrs. Merkel be less? And uh, 
Mario Draghi has been more. Could I answer that question? Please. I, I, well, first of all, I think there will be more inflation in Germany, which will be a good thing, actually, to help even up the balance. I also think there'll be less austerity in Europe, which will also be a good thing to even up the balance. I think Weidmann uh, will continue to have Merkel's ear, and I think he becomes, if you like, uh, more important as a result of Angela Merkel clearly still being a very pivotal figure, unless there is the chance of a, a red, red green coalition, which I think is rather unlikely, but we'll see the spectre being raised from time to time. So I think the, uh, the Bundesbank um, will appear to have more than just one vote amongst the, the 23. I actually think that uh, he and Draghi play a fairly constructive role. He's actually helping to prevent uh, some calls on Mr. Draghi that Draghi doesn't want himself. And there will also be an absolutely uh, a holy alliance between Draghi and Weidmann in trying to resist the official creditor write-offs, uh, because that would damage uh, the whole strategy of the, the, the so-called OMT, under which the ECB may start buying government bonds. So in fact, there's going to be more commonality amongst the central bankers than you might think in, in also in seeking to stave off uh, the, the write-off of the Greek debts which are owed to the central banks. The, the unfortunate thing is that that will mean, though, that more money has to be written off by the taxpayers directly and also by, of course, the private sector hedge funds on the whole who own some Greek government debt. They're being promised that this will be exonerated. They've got all sorts of clauses written into it, but I think they have to really get some very good lawyers to make sure that those debts do not also suffer from some write-downs. So I, th I think the central banks will once again be in an incredibly interesting and powerful position. Could you just ask why, why you think that there would be less austerity in Europe? Is it because you, you imagine a uh, uh, lifting of um, productivity and, and growth in Europe, or, or why would you say that? There no, I think, growth, I, I think growth will be very weak, and, and there will yeah. be massive pressure on the Germans, which the Germans will give in to, to relax uh, these constraints. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just inevitable. Otherwise, the system will break up, because the system was brought about, after all, to promote jobs and prosperity and investment. You can have a recession without monetary union. I mean, we British, we, we can have a recession without monetary union. We're very, very good at producing that kind of thing. The whole point about monetary union is it was supposed to promote jobs and, and a, a feeling of well-being, and therefore there will have to be a relaxation of this so-called austerity. OK, good, thank you. Uh, another, another question. Um, yes, the gentleman, the gentleman there. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Gérard Legrain, and I'm a member of Chatham House. I would like to ask Mr. Killinger why he thinks that austerity cannot be softened for both the underclass in Germany and uh, the Mediterranean countries. After all, sacri if sacrifices have to be made for the Lumpen, they'll be made by the companies more than by the government. Um, and um, so we talk of two different constituencies in terms of cost for German money. Well, I may have misspoken when, when, you, uh, when, when it led you to think that I, 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 I imagine that austerity will, will stay in place. In fact, I think she will have to loosen the rein on the domestic side and <coughs> allow for more flexibility by helping some of the disenfranchised uh, uh, classes she will have to do so because I think the SPD will demand this as a condition for entering uh, into government. Um, the, uh, uh, that's why I think a loosening of the austerity will take place. I also agree with David that at the same time uh, something will have to give in Europe. How eventually she will configure this and sell it to, to, to the population without making them fearful that too much money will be drained off the German coffers. Uh, I don't know, and, and uh, the danger of inflation, of course, as, as David said, uh, it may be good uh, for uh, writing the balance, but Germans will forever be fearful of another round of inflation, even with only one or two more points, as you know, which is a national sort of collective nightmare. I know, but that is absurd, isn't it? It's I mean, a little bit of inflation of does actually oil the wheels of the economy, doesn't it? Well, as Helmut Schmidt famously said some 30 years ago, i would rather have two points more inflation than two points more unemployment. Uh, so uh, that might be the way it will go. Uh, so you will have to risk a certain uh, amelioration and, 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 and risk uh, inflation going up somewhat. 
uh, something will have to give, and the SPD will, will demand that, both on the European level and the domestic level. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Um, I think there's going to be quite a lot of questions. Yes, right at, right at the back. Hi, yes. Um, I have two tweets that have come in from members watching the live stream. Uh, the first is from Christopher Malaby, who was UK ambassador in Germany in 1988 to 1992. Can the panel predict confidently who would lead the SPD in a grand coalition and what their views are on Europe? Can you comment on that, please? Also, Tristan Asprey has asked, what policy directions does the panel expect the government to take in the area of rising energy prices and the ongoing energy transformation? Thank you. Questions, questions befitting a former ambassador, I would say. <laughs> could, could I have a stab at the SPD? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be like a Jean-Paul Sartre play, because the SPD will be in opposition to any government at the same time, and so it will be very, very schizophrenic. I think they will want to do more good things in Europe. They, they will want to uh, raise spending for the uh, impoverished, debt-ridden South. Um, they will be drawn towards things like pooling the uh, credit standing of Germany with the other countries, but they won't actually go absolutely over that route. I think the, the new finance minister is quite likely to be a very um, able person, Mr. Asmussen, no, who's at the moment at the European Central Bank, and he's managed to do enough hawkish things at the ECB to convince people that he's maybe not such a bad chap after all. Um, and so he will come from the ECB and be, and be the finance minister, and that will be really a very good way, I think, of, of showing that the Germans are still terribly keen about the euro. He's a confidant of, of Schäuble, and there'll be a certain amount of continuity there. But I repeat, you can't spend the same tax spending uh, two or three times over, so borrowing will have to increase. There will, there will be a danger that the international markets will look at this uh, and will decide that Germany's credit standing is not quite as hot as everybody had thought. And I think once that happens, then you, you will get a little bit of genuine fearfulness. I, I discount the fear of inflation. There's no inflation at the moment in Germany to be seen. I think what the Germans might be worried about is if the uh, credit standing of the German state goes down on the international markets. Uh, yeah. I, I, I will skip except for saying that the SPD also demands uh, uh, things like uh, uh, raising of the minimum wage across Germany, which Angela Merkel has resisted so far, which will be an extra burden on business. I'm sure they also call for higher taxes for the rich, uh, which will throw another spanner in the works of how this coalition is going to come together. Uh, about Europe and, and the debt problem, David has said what needs to be said, so I don't have to repeat that. But uh, um, we, we really have, uh, all things told, a very tough round of negotiations before us. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Merkel uh, looks uh, rather vulnerable to have to answer to all those demands that the SPD will want to put on the table. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can't really speak with confidence about, uh, the, uh, about energy policy, so I will um, eschew that. But I'm also frankly not confident about who will be the SPD leadership um, heading into the negotiations, mm -hmm. because Steinbrück has made it very clear that he does not intend to play a part in a government. Um, and I, it, uh, his red lines there have been so strong that I cannot imagine that anybody would lead coalition negotiations who, can't, who wouldn't consider himself a potential minister. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm missing some historical fact here, but I find that hard to imagine. Gabriel, of course, is damaged by this result, and Gabriel is also damaged by the amount of infighting that went on between him and, and, and Steinbrück. Um, I mean, they're all damaged, frankly, which, which makes it difficult. And then there's Steinmeier, who presumably um, thinks of himself as a potential foreign minister, although I think with some mental reservations, um, uh, but who I think was far happier as, as, as opposition leader, the SPD party leader in the Bundestag, um, I think, than, than in the ministry. So this is uh, it's still a very open field. We'll have to wait for the party conference and then see what happens. I, I think one yeah. thing, if I may, one really positive thing, and I'm a great admirer of Stein, but would be that if they could tempt him to... <coughs> Yeah. be in the government and give him a kind of super ministry, combine yeah. the Wirtschafts Ministerium and yeah. the Finance Ministry. Yeah, that, that might be the one thing that yeah. could get him to stay. I think he's a great loss to German politics. Yeah. He's very sharp, very, and he did a very good uh, television yeah. debate. He's obviously a bit 
too quick-witted for his own mm -hmm. self. And bad uh, judgment sometimes. on photographs, wouldn't you think? Yes, that yeah. too. <laughs> but, but maybe you know, somebody like you advising him concerns here, you know, he'll have good judgment on everything. <laughs> uh, one thing to, to add about the foreign ministry and the portfolio, and where to go and who will be foreign minister, that's one of the positive results of the elections. I think foreign, a German foreign minister no longer cuts much ice with anyone starting with Germany or beyond. The, the foreign policy decisions are all uh, anchored at the Chancellor's office, uh, and the Foreign Minister will have to do the bidding of what the Chancellor but says. Can I, can I disagree with that partially? It's true, of course, that every ch Chancellor in German history has sort of um, sucked at the, the key foreign policy issues and pulled them over to the Chancellery. But what people, I think, tend to take less notice of is that the Chancellery has a very, very small own Chancellery staff and that they pull people over from the other ministries to work in the chancery on issues, whose loyalties then do not, of necessity, lie with the chancery. Obviously, it inflates, the, it inflates their sense of self-importance. But they do very much have tribal loyalties with the foreign ministries, if that's where they come from, because they know they'll be going back there. It's one thing. The other thing is that the Germans, while they're pretty bad on overall strategy and, and the vision thing and all that, they're very good on the tactical and operative stuff. And for that, you need staff, and you, you need expert staff. Again, the chancery is too small for that. And so the, all, that, all those bits continue to reside in the foreign ministry, are made there and are shaped there by some people who know exactly what they're doing and won't take directions from the chancery on the detail stuff, which is important. Does anyone want to, I mean, literally in one minute, stab yeah. at Sir Christopher Madaby's question on energy policy, and whether it's sustainable? No good at that. No, okay. Okay. Prices will go up. Price will go up. It's a question mark. What, what price you pay for abrogating nuclear energy? That was not thought through. It wasn't costed. It was just decided upon overnight. Uh, and, and to hell with the consequences. Yeah. Now you can say, uh, under the pressure of having to come up with alternative energies at affordable prices, that will accelerate the process of finding solutions. We can only hope for the best, but it's hope against hope in many areas. And I can agree with David. Prices will go up. And that's another burden on the, on the, on the treasury. Uh, on, the, on people's pockets in Germany. Well, we've got about a quarter of an hour, so we're going to have uh, 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 one or two uh, more questions. Yeah, yes, the lady there. The lady just there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Jill Hamilton, um, member Chatham House. Will Mrs. Merkel continue her unconditional support of Israel? I think the short answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, look, um, on Israel, uh, Merkel has famously been sort of extremely unconditional in the way she phrases her support. I think that that has helped her be quite tough and quite direct to Israeli leaders in private. But um, one of the measures of her effectiveness is that that stuff remains behind closed doors. Um, but I, I don't think, I mean, it, you know, is, Israeli embassy and Israeli leaders uh, read German opinion polls. They know that certain aspects of Israeli policy, and first and foremost, the settlements, are deeply unpopular in Germany. And that this is a chancellor who is acutely, exquisitely sensitive to public opinion. Yeah? So it is one, say, one thing to say that the support of Israel is Deutsche Staatsraison, which I happen to agree with for all sorts of reasons. And another thing entirely, to disagree with specific policy issues, or perhaps you know, not be entirely enamored of certain Israeli leaders. Yeah? and think they're sort of their pronouncements less than useful on some occasions. Mm -hmm. yeah? In which case, I think Merkel would speak her mind. I'm pretty sure she will, and does, and, and she's quite good at that. But so she does do behind closed doors. Precisely, which is, I think, professional and effective of her, mm. rather than pontificating you know, in front of a the microphone. There you go. So. Anyone else? Yeah. What I'm going to do now is cluster um, some questions, take them in groups, and taking them in groups of three. Um, mm. Sir Michael Arthur, gentleman there who's Persistence must surely be rewarded, and the lady behind in the maroon, in the maroon top. Um, yes. Um, so over here, uh, yes. Well, it doesn't matter what order. Yes, go on. Thank you very much. I was just going to ask a yeah. follow up to Christopher's okay. question, actually, I and mean, I think you're, all three of you are missing the point. Is it conceivable that now she no longer has to start negotiating with the Greens, what's it going beyond that, that she could just bring the pragmatists that she is, and the sensible scientists that she is, she could do a double bit. Thank you. Uh, yes, the gentleman there and the lady behind. Yes, Carl Wright, I work for the Commonwealth, so I'd like to lob in a sort of, say, more international question. Um, 
given the sort of terrible events in Nairobi in the last few days, which have refocused attention, I think, on global terrorism and failed states, and I would argue development policy, how far is RECs of Entwicklungspolitik, of development policy, on, on the radar at all in Germany, given the election was rather domestic, from Merkel talked about Dich de Fenster, you know, um, having, having closed windows and so on, and indeed there's a resistance to bailing out the European states. How far is it going to be uh, a global leadership in line with uh, Merkel's political position in the world? Yes. Hello, uh, Priska Metz, Chatham House member. Um, I want to ask why you are so pessimistic about the prospects of a coalition with the Greens. Because I think um, there are some points in favor, like for example, the, the CDU and the Greens together could make a very good job on the on an energy vendor. And I'm not sure if I understood the question that the, he was asking, but maybe it goes in the same direction. And then I think also, I mean, the Greens recently, they have kind of acknowledged that one of the reasons why they lost so many points in elections also because maybe they placed themselves a little bit too far on the left. So this would be another point. And then the third point, I mean, as you all said, we all agree that for the SPD, it would be very um, bad for the long-term prospects to enter in this coalition. So in a way, like I personally <laughs> do see some potential for a coalition with the Greens. I would just like to get your opinion on that, why you mm. think it's not very probable. C could I make a point about the Greens? It, we did think up until about a year ago that they had moved uh, much more to the centre in terms of their economic policies, mm. and I thought that was a wholly positive thing. Yeah. It I seems to have shifted that. back. Yeah now to the left uh, and I don't think that is a very good basis for going into coalition uh, with the CDU and the CSU. H however, we don't really know what the new shape of the leadership will be. Uh, so I, I think it will be one of the permutations that we do see on the table. Uh, in terms of uh, development policy, I think the Germans will continue to be very idealistic about these things. And in fact, the, the fact that they're turning away in some ways in terms of their trade and investment relationships from for Europe may actually make them more interested in other parts of the world, uh, also countries that are manifestly very unstable. So I don't think there's any let up of this very impressive uh, idealistic attachment to the third world. We will, though, of course, simply see pressure on public spending, even though they will raise the, the borrowing limits. But I think many German people would probably think that it's better to spend money on decent development aid to really poor countries than it is to pump more money into, say, Greek or Cypriot banks. And, and I think also that they're absolutely right. So I rather welcome this, uh, this, this German idealism when it comes to development policies. And I, I, I hope and believe that this will remain maintained. I, I will leave the energy question perhaps to Constanze, except to, to <laughs> Michael. Who has already said that she doesn't know anything about well, it, right? So okay, Michael, you. I wonder if you could rephrase your question. I wasn't quite sure I got the gist of it. Could it did seem rather ambassadorial. It was just too complicated for us to understand. No, no. <laughs> could you say she it again? She made a move on energy policy. W yeah. Yeah. It was because uh, she made a move on energy policy, partly with a view to a conceivable future coalition with the Greeks. I mean, that's mm. how one of the uh, underlying thoughts I had at the time she did it. Now that moment is past, and let's assume mm. that you're right on that. Um, and she is a very sensible pragmatist who realizes that you have to do things that you have to do. And she's pretty good at doing 180 degree turns. There's a whole range of those mm. over the years. Can so we that's what you would do if one. you were no. her. That's a sort of finely tuned Whitehall mind working here. It's, it sounds jolly clever, I think. <laughs> well, I, mm. I, I think I, I beg to uh, disagree with the notion that she could do a U-turn, uh, flip-flop back into atomic energy. It wasn't just the Green Party yeah. that caused her to uh, abrogate atomic energy. It was the sense that she felt the entire population was going down that route. Mm -hmm. And she wants to stay in, in, in cahoots, as it were, with the sentiment of the German mind and how it works. Uh, the German angst here is a major factor. She did the right thing, I think, at the time, and said, well, I'll have to bow to this, uh, uh, to realities uh, and leave it behind, not just because of the Greens. Uh, about the Greens, I agree with you personally for democratic uh, culture. It would be much better to have a strong opposition like the SPD and a smaller coalition between the CDU and the Greens. Uh, but if it comes to having to make concessions to the left, it's much better to do so to the SPD than to a small, somewhat insignificant Green Party. For one reason only that uh, David mentioned, the SPD reigns supreme in the Bundesrat. And they have, if, if yeah. Angela Merkel went into government with the Greens, yeah. they could continue an obstructionist policy Completely. in the Bundesrat. Yeah. So it's much better for her to buy off, as it were, the SPD 
uh, and, and create a coalition program which makes it so much harder for the Bundesrat majority, the SPD, to stand in the way and throw a spanner. But, but also, if I may just add one sentence before Constancy on, yeah. on that, the, the fact that the Linke have now become the third force in the parliament, yeah. I think <coughs> people will not be able to treat them as pariahs any longer. To mm. use your word, Tom, it doesn't sound very democratic. So I would have thought that all these different uh, calculations, mm. you know, as the coalition nights wear on, and they will wear on, will now become on the table. Mm. Okay, a couple of very quick points. Uh, one shouldn't treat Die Linke as pariahs anyway, except maybe the fossilized West German communists, really, who, who just, I mean, have sh just keep proving that they haven't learned a thing. Um, the, the Linke electorate, and in fact the Linke representatives that are from Eastern Germany, um, vote for Die Linke, work for Die Linke, because they don't feel represented by the major West German parties as they still think of them, because they think of them as carpetbaggers, even 20 years after reunification. I think that ought to be taken seriously, and many of them by now are pragmatists. The Linke have just issued a rather interesting paper on security policy, which is, of course, an outstretched arm to the SPD, whom they do want to turn eventually, if not within the next uh, legislature, then after that. Um, and I, and I, you can see their minds working on that. So do take the linker very seriously and study them. And, um, and I think they ought to be involved in things. Um, you should bring them here. In a given of Sir Michael, I mean, God knows. I mean, I certainly agree with you that Angela Merkel is a complete pragmatist when it comes to these things. But she does, as I said, read public opinion very carefully. Germans are very, very, very against nuclear power. It's a, it's a German thing. And I was just thinking that this reminded me of, of something else that I think, you know, the, the famous German angst that is always apostrophized here and elsewhere and that mystifies people. I grew up mostly outside of Germany because I'm a diplomat's brat. And I, I remember coming to university in Germany and being mystified by this myself this extraordinary atmosphere of oppression um, in, the, in, the, in the first half of the 80s. And then, and then I realized a little later that um, uh, doing a little bit of security policy, um, that you know, sort of the, 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 the plans for, for a, sort of a nuclear escalation uh, in the, during the Cold War involved Germany um, being involved first in a, in a conventional war and then becoming more or less a nuclear wasteland. Um, in short order, about three weeks after the beginning of con conventional warfare. I think that really did prey on people's minds extraordinarily. Um, and, it, and it has a great deal to do with people's fears of environmental degradation, of, uh, of uncertainty, and so on. This, this does matter, and it's, and it's deeply ingrained in the same way that, that an earlier generation's fear of inflation was ingrained, and as, as was mentioned here earlier. Um, Finally, uh, on, on development aid, I'm not so sure that Germans are still so enamored of that. I mean, the, the, the liberal development aid minister, Niebel, was quite successful at, um, at redesigning the development aid ministry, um, and I'm not quite sure where that's heading. I would, quite frankly, like to see some of that combined with a stronger attention paid to security, particularly in, in Europe's periphery. And finally, on the Greens, um, I think it's entirely right to say that uh, Angela Merkel would be extremely unwise to form a coalition with the Greens um, because then she would lose the Bundestag. She, she, would have, she would be faced with sustained opposition in the Bundestag. 77% of all German laws need the consent of the Bundesrat. I'm sorry, mm. I'm, I meant Bundesrat. 77%. That would mean obstructionism all the way from here uh, to 2017. If she doesn't want that, she forms a coalition with the SPD. That said, I think there will be a lot of long knives um, in, in the, in the, uh, pulled out in the Green Party. I texted a Green politician uh, um, after, after the election, said, so what happens now? And he said, I think the, the carnivores will, will, will eat the vegetarians. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll see I what will, happens. There I are will, some carnivores, the, even in the Green Party. <laughs> I'll try to make time, uh, with Chatham House's permission, um, uh, for one more round. We're getting to seven, but of three, of three questions. Uh, so, uh, as I said before, please keep it short and sweet. Gentleman at the back, there's a lady there, yes? And the gentleman, and the gentleman here, and I think that'll be it, so. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Peter Ziganek, I'm a member of the BGA. Um, just on the one positive aspect that you mentioned is, on the outcome, is that there is no anti-European party in the uh, parliament. Would you expect the AFD to grow stronger over the next four years, or would you um, see it as a one-off effect? Good, that's one. Um, yes, then the lady, yes, that's right. 
Thank you. Thank you. Irina von Wies, I'm also a member of the BGA. Um, I wanted to relieve Maurice of his personal angst that the question he's been waiting for would not be asked. So here it is. What does the shifting landscape in Berlin mean for British-German relations and notably for the anticipated referendum on European membership? Thank you. Thank you for that. I've never met you before, so it's not to, yes, I don't think this is some cronyism thing plays here. <laughs> but it's a question I think needs, <laughs> needs to be put. Uh, yes, and the gentleman here will be our last questioner. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, Jim Arima from Jetro. Uh, sorry, again, uh, the question about <laughs> energy policy. Can you say uh, you, uh, sorry, where you're from? Jim Arima from Jetro, Japan External Trade Organization. Oh, I see. The, uh, another question about energy policy. I fully understand uh, the German people's allergy towards nuclear, but at the same time, German people are suffering from higher energy prices, as you said. So, uh, with that nuclear, how Chancellor Merkel or new coalition government can reduce uh, the energy prices, a more dependence on, say, fossil energy, like a coal or something, or lignite. Mm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. uh, I'll, I'll be Tom. brief about energy. I mean, it's, it's uh, what was Churchill once said about the Soviet Union, a riddle in Southern Enigma, wrapped in a mystery. This is what I say about German energy policy and the question of reducing price levels. It is, to me, a riddle in Southern Enigma, wrapped in a mystery, how she will solve that conundrum. Uh, about the AFD, I, I, I believe there is something like uh, the list der Vernunft, as Hegel used to call it, in certain election results. And the fact that AFD just didn't quite manage to get to the Bundestag is, is such a list, such an uh, interesting um, um, uh, decision by, by forces beyond our control to guide our fate. There is enough sense of worry in the land, but not so much as to allow another party to, to, to clobber the government on the issue of the euro. Yes, Germans are still not quite convinced that this currency is here to stay. At the same time, they've become used to it. They, 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 they conceive the notion that overnight it will disappear with greater dread than continuing with it. It's rather like Hamlet's famous monologue in, 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 in the first act. You know, the fear of something after death will restrain us all. Uh, and, uh, and so forth. This is exactly the sentiment in Germany. Yes, they don't quite like the euro enough, not as much as they used to like the Deutschmark, but to think that it might disappear will throw up all sorts of uncertainties which they fear even more. But German-British relations, they will be amicable, uh, and it will be up to, to both uh, Cameron and Merkel to see if they can work in a fashion which ensures us um, Constance has said that Britain will remain in the EU and not cut her face to uh, cut her nose to spite her face. Uh, we, we, we are very Anglophile in Germany, uh, and, and the notion that we could do without Britain, as you remember, is, is quite uh, anathema. I remind you of what uh, um, Chancellor Adenauer once said in 1953 when we were discussing the European Defence Community uh, high on the agenda, which was finally shot down by the Assemblée in Paris. And he talked to the top echelon of his party in early 53 and said, we need Britain on board so that we're not left alone with a more or less hysterical friend. <laughs> <laughs> this is Adenauer. I mean, they used to speak quite, you know, uh, openly. No and, and, uh, to didn't the mince audience. their words yeah. in 1953, <laughs> as I said to now. So <laughs> I, I, I think there is um, a sense that we need to work together. But it's up to the British Prime Minister to see, uh, well, for one thing, we don't even know whether Cameron will still be on board and still be at the helm in, in, in 2017. That's another big if, mm, much larger than some of the ifs that we've discussed today in Germany. Uh, but uh, when, when the chips are down, they will both try and work out a formula. It, 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 it's, it goes down well in Britain to think that they have a friend in Germany uh, with whom they can do business, um, and, and, and equally in Germany. They're very happy with a closer relation to Britain, never mind the problems that she throws up. Uh, in, in terms of soft power, Britain is the most influential country in, 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 in Germany. If you want to bring about a collapse of German news industry, you only have to threaten with withholding British news from German news channels, be it printed or radio or whatever, and the whole entertainment industry would collapse. <laughs> I, I know of which I speak because I'm Down constantly... Abby. Yeah, don't have it, just one, but little things. Uh, every day uh, they, they come to me with uh, requests for, for stories from Britain. Uh, the other way around, very little from Germany makes it into the front page news here in this country. So I, I don't think we will, uh, we will want to let go of Britain. And I predict uh, uh, a formula to emerge. I don't know how it will be, but for the two countries to forge a common course to, to not uh, let Britain uh, leave the, 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 the EU. 
any other right. thing, any very, of the very, very three last questions? I think the AFD will be the alternative for Germany will be strengthened by the fact that they're not in government. For the simple reason that historical experience in Germany shows whenever an extreme party, and they are in some ways an extreme party, uh, gets voted into power in Germany on the regional level, then proceeds to shoot itself in the foot comprehensively uh, for one legislature, and then is voted out of power because it's proved incompetent. Um, the AFD, I think, is made of sterner stuff, and it will continue to exert a sort of an außerparlamentarische opposition, an extra parliamentary par uh, opposition role. Um, and I think that, that will be interesting and, and not unimportant, so something to watch. Um, UK, Germany, yeah, I agree with all that's been said, but you know, um, I think, frankly, the, the Anglophilia in Germany is not what it was when I was a child. That sort of cultural sort of affection, I mean, you know, yes, you've got tons of people watching Downton Abbey, but does, does that translate into Europe policy? No. Um, and I, I was at a dinner about a year ago uh, where you had a senior German policymaker talk to a group of, of, of senior Brits about uh, what she thought ought to be, was going to happen to Europe policy uh, and what the, you know, the price that, what that Germany was willing to pay. And frankly, um, I think some of the Brits were startled by the sternness of the, of the discourse that they, uh, it's not the, it's, it was, it's not, it was not your usual dinner speech stuff. And I think that this was serious, credible, and pretty fierce. So uh, while I think there will be some sort of deal, and frankly, on Europe policy, the, the Chancellor has already said there will be as much integration as, uh, from, at least from, from a Berlin point of view, as is necessary to make Europe functioning. And otherwise, we're looking towards repatriation of some European competences to the national mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, there is already Agreed. policy mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. But do not expect that Berlin will be willing to pay any price to keep the Great Britain in, in, the, in, in Europe. I don't see that happening, and I think there will be a great deal of coolness to anybody who thinks otherwise but we emanating still don't from Berlin. want to be left with a more or less hysterical French. <laughs> that is an, <laughs> an absolute. A Rhinelander speaks. <laughs> well, I'm from Danzig. Could I, yes, yes, could I try to synthesize the, yeah. the three issues? Because I think they are all linked, and I think the common thread is industry. Um, industry clearly wants to keep the euro alive, and, and this will mean that the protest party will remain a protest party. Although I agree with the consensus uh, that they're actually surprisingly sane and lucid, and they have been asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. I think they've improved the quality of German debates, actually. Yeah. I think it's very good yeah, for democracy. True that this AFD has been there. And they're not uh, right-wing well, people. They're, they're actually quite sensible, middle-of-the-road people. But they so flirted it, with the right-wing in, yeah, the, in yeah, the elections, so well, yeah, which who, is not doesn't nice. flirt from time to time. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think there's, the industry clearly wants um, to have the euro because there's this huge fear factor, as you say. Yeah. I remember meeting Laurent uh, Fabius, who's now the foreign minister, and he was saying about three years ago in, in France that were the uh, mark to come back, it will be a doppel mark. It will be 100% higher than the present yeah. euro. I think he was exaggerating a little bit, but mm. clearly there would be a, a huge appreciation, and the German industrialists don't like that. The energy issue that you, that you mentioned, I think that will drive uh, more business to seek um, production sites abroad, in, in, including possibly even in the UK. I don't think our energy policy has much to recommend it, but at least there is an attempt to produce a, a decent energy mix. I also think that uh, industry and business will be very keen within Germany to maintain a link with the UK, partly because of the French issue, partly because I think we will have a fairly unstable government uh, and we will have a quarrelsome government in, uh, in Berlin. And therefore, I think um, business will somehow seek its own agenda. Something I never, mm. I never tire of saying is that last year, exports and imports, obviously the British imports a little bit higher than the British exports, um, with Germany, Britain was the biggest trading partner of Germany last year. I think that does count. And therefore, I think uh, in terms of German-British relations, I'm relatively optimistic about all this. I think there is a, a common thread, uh, the way that the two countries face up to globalization, the way that they face up to um, the demands on the state. I think there's a a similar feeling. We we maybe become a bit more German in the way we approach things in this country, and that's probably a good thing. I, th I think in, in terms of the the Germans, this repatriation that uh, you've been talking about, I think there is an element there. Um, Mrs. Merkel doesn't want to 
create a European super state. She knows it's very unpopular. Uh, Ron Freeman mentioned by man, he's been the one actually saying that nobody in Europe wants to have political union, uh, and that's why it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think in all those three issues, that there is a common thread that is actually driving Britain and Germany together. It could easily be that in four years' time, we'll be up here on this panel again, or another set of people, and everything will have remained absolutely the same. Greece will be in the Euro, the, the Scots will remain in the UK, and Britain will remain in the European Union. That, that's a, quite a credible uh, set Mario. of, of mm. circumstances, actually. I also tend to think that a single currency is a lovely thing to talk about in a discussion, one will have a wonderful time of it. But I actually do think that there's far more important things in Europe than the single currency. And I think one of them is this issue of people visiting each other. I take the point about we shouldn't rely too much on the Germans because they've got lots of other things to do and we're just one country in Europe. But I'm always impressed when I go to Berlin. Um, EasyJet uh, and Ryanair, I think, have done far more for German-British integration and also for a certain European solidarity <laughs> than any number of monetary <laughs> plans and economic commissioners in well, that Brussels. depends on your EasyJet experience. No, well, no, uh, <laughs> I mean, well, I, your, I, Reiner, your Reiner experience is this. I, 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 Don't get me started. I, I, I always <laughs> tend to sit next to incredibly good-looking young German women, actually, oh, on, good for you. On, on, on EasyJet. Oh, I'm, so I'm not sure, so sure about Ryanair. But, <laughs> but, but, but uh, I mean, it's a serious point that there's a tremendous number of young people going backwards and forwards to London, Berlin, other cities all the time. And I think that didn't happen. 20 or 30 years ago, and that's, uh, that's something that we should all rejoice yeah. in, and that's happened despite the fact we're not in the Euro. In fact, my final point would be the fact that we're not in the Euro has been incredibly good for German-British relations, because, in fact, if anything goes wrong, God, we yes. know it's our own government, our own Bank of England, our own Chancellor, Can't we don't blame, blame it on somebody else. else. Mm. I think it's the kind of de-responsibilisation of European politics that has been really bad, because you people don't blame it on their own incompetence, they blame it on Angela Merkel or the ECB or Brussels. We obviously do from time to time bring in Brussels, but on the whole, we know it's our own fault, and I think that's very good. And if we've got an idiot as the Prime Minister, we tend to kick him out. Well, <laughs> final <laughs> word. Uh, <laughs> just to, before, before we thank our excellent speakers, just to remind you that there is a, uh, there's a reception, a drinks uh, reception on the ground floor, and uh, everybody is very cordially invited to that. Uh, but it only remains for me to, for us collectively, I hope, to thank our excellent speakers um, and uh, I think we've had a, a, a very fruitful, very uh, uh, rich, what, 70 odd minutes, uh, longer than expected um, and uh, we could have gone on for a long time, sadly there isn't time but thank you again um, and uh, I think we've had a, a, a very rewarding um, discussion. Thank you.